Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and let's finally talk about IMHA. Immune mediated hemolytic anemia is something of a boogeyman in immunology and that's not entirely undeserved. The condition has a survival rate of only about 50%, which is not great. And it's a condition that's potentially iatrogenic, which means basically that a medical treatment might have triggered it. This is particularly relevant to our discussion around vaccines. But before we go too far, have you watched the previous immunology videos? Because I'm going to talk in particular about erythrocytes, the red blood cells, megakaryocytes and their platelets, and of course B cells and their antibody production. But almost every cell type in the immune system gets a look in with IMHA. So what am I actually talking about? when I say immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. Basically, immune-mediated means that the immune system is the cause of the problem. Anemia means that there is not enough red blood cells. And hemolytic means that they all exploded. Obviously, that should be a very bad thing. These animals often present with severe anemias and the associated symptoms like white gums, weakness, a high heart rate, panting or collapse, but they've not bled anywhere. Their blood volume and proteins are usually near normal. You'll hopefully recall that the immune system creates lots of different but highly specific antibodies to potentially millions of different combinations of antigens. And it makes different arrangements for these antibodies. Sometimes, generally by accident, those antibodies will target an antigen that they shouldn't. In IMHA and hypersensitivity type 2 reactions in general, IgG and IgM molecules are targeting antigen on the surface of the red blood cells. These molecules bind to the red blood cells and either activate the complement system, which is more complicated than I intend to go into, but makes the cells pop, or flags them for other immune system cells to phagocytose. That's a fancy way of saying that the other cells eat the tagged red blood cells. This is where macrophages, neutrophils, and all the other granulocytes come into play because they will gobble up red blood cells flagged with antibodies, just like they gobble up a flagged anything else. Sometimes they consume the whole cell and sometimes they just take a chunk of membrane out leaving spherocytes behind. Spherocytes are red blood cells that have lost their inner tube shape and are now more spherical, which is a classic sign of IMHA. They are almost round and they're much smaller than a typical red blood cell. Red blood cells may also start autoagglutinating, which means the cells stick to each other. You can see this happen on a microscope slide or even the wall of a blood test tube. Basically, because an antibody has multiple binding sites, they can stick to two different red blood cells, which binds them together. When this happens inside a body, the blood doesn't flow properly, and this is obviously very bad. But this is all a perfectly normal process. It's just affecting the wrong target. So the question I hope you're asking is how did the immune system get it so wrong? We talk about two main types of IMHA, though in clinical practice, it doesn't always matter which one we're dealing with. We treat them basically the same way. Primary IMHA occurs when you have antibodies directed to antigens that are naturally occurring on the surface of the red blood cells. Secondary IMHA occurs when the immune system develops antibodies to something else, which happens to get stuck on the surface of these red blood cells. Red blood cells are spongy little things that are prone to soaking up all sorts of things to carry them around the body. It's kind of what they do. These other antigens which are not naturally occurring on the surface of red blood cells might include bloodborne parasites, like heartworm or lepto or hemobartonella, cancer, 
including lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma, which is a tumour of blood vessel walls, different drugs, and antibiotics are probably the most common culprit here. Various toxins, um, for example, bee stings, and this is where vaccinations potentially come in. Now, vaccinations interacting with IMHA is particularly interesting, and I'm not totally convinced one way or another, whether it's a primary or a secondary IMHA that it's involved in. But they are associated loosely with vaccines, but it's not something I stress hugely about. IMHA happens seemingly at random, and it can occur basically after any type of immune system stimulation. A vaccine is definitely one type of immune system stimulation, and for dogs receiving an annual vaccination, it might be the most common type of immune system stimulation that they come across. Approximately 33% of cases of IMHA occur within three months of a vaccine. That sounds like quite a lot, but if it was purely random chance, you'd still expect 25% of IMH cases to occur within three months because there's 12 months in a year, just by chance. So there's some association, but having said that IMHA is very rare overall. I might see two or three cases per year and approximately half of those cases have a cancer somewhere. In cats, it's a little different. Most of the cases I've seen in cats have had a blood-borne parasite like Mycoplasma haemophilus. As far as other predispositions go, Cocker Spaniel dogs are very predisposed, but also poodles and their various crossbreeds. But any animal with an immune system can develop IMHA. There is another very similar condition with a nearly identical process called immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, or IM. TP for short. Thrombocytes are a fancy name for the platelets and they're produced by megakaryocytes. These cells come from the same stem cell line as the red blood cells and can be targeted by the same accidental process that occurs in IMHA, resulting this time in a clotting disorder. Penia just means you haven't got enough of those cells. It's not as common as IMHA because megakaryocytes are not as inclined to soak up different and exciting antigens as the red blood cells are, but you can also get both of them occurring together because the cell types are closely related. You can also get immune mediated destruction of the precursor cells and the stem cells earlier in that cell development line, which is a much more severe condition. IMHA affecting red blood stem cells may not appear regenerative at all and may only be diagnosed with a bone marrow biopsy because these precursors aren't even reaching the bloodstream. Ultimately, whether the case is primary or secondary IMHA, it's treated in a very similar way. If you have a predisposing cause, like a parasite or a drug, then you get rid of it. At the same time, you load the patient up on immunosuppressants to stop the antibody production against their own cells and to slow down the phagocytosis. The body will try to regenerate from the anemia or the thrombocytopenia. It just needs a break from destroying its own cells. Some patients will need to remain on medication for the rest of their lives. Others can be weaned off, but very slowly. Careful monitoring is required to ensure they don't relapse when you're not watching. While IMHA can be idiopathic and can occur secondary to just about anything under the sun, the condition is a stressful one for the treating vet because of its high mortality rate and the persistent worry that you've done something or given something that's triggered it. It's one of these conditions where you plan for the worst, but you hope for the best. It's unpredictable and not really anybody's fault that you've done something or, or given something, 
because it's the immune system that's misbehaving. But it's still that boogeyman that we worry about in immunology. I hope that's explained a couple of things for you. I know it's a lot to take in. But my name is Dr. Ferox, and I'll catch you next time.